I have no idea what resolution my laptop thinks this thing has. Ah, oh, better. Yeah, sometimes you just gotta unplug it and plug it back in. Yeah, that's called a plug-in tray. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good afternoon. This is the Think to Think Research Group. I'm Carsten Brommann. This is Ari Carolyn. And it's Thursday afternoon. Uh, so if, if uh, you get the impression that, that we're behaving a little bit strangely, it's just because we are uh, completely exhausted and are leaving this hotel at 4 o'clock tomorrow morning to go on to the next meeting. Um, there is a much better node weight slide, which we uh, failed to paste in here. Uh, so you can just go to uh, IRTF org IPR uh, for details. Uh, but I think by this time of the meeting, you, you have uh, uh, seen that. Uh, so you handed out the pink sheets. We have no takers. Yes. Uh, do we have a Jabba? Uh, Hannes, if man is locked in. Hannes, have you mentioned again? So can somebody show Hannes the internet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, well. Yeah, there, there is a mailing list, uh, as with uh, any research group or working group. And most importantly, we put out a GitHub repository uh, for each of our meetings. And the one for this meeting is uh, uh, t2trg slash 2018-iatf101. So we have a, a nice program assembled for today. Uh, so the, the chairs will uh, quickly speak about uh, the research group and, and the uh, status. Uh, then uh, Michael Costa will report from the hackathon that we had on the weekend and from the, the wishy effort that was underlying that. Then uh, Jan Jungbohm will talk about something that sooner or later we all will have to do, put some machine learning on our microcontrollers. And while he will not talk so much about how that is going to influence our work, I think we all can, can start uh, imagining that. Then uh, Sumya will uh, talk about a, a project that uh, extends the range of interoperability testing to semantic interoperability. So that, that will fit nicely to, to Michael's uh, talk. And uh, finally, we will have a talk, and I'm not going to try to say his name uh, on, on a microphone, uh, from someone with a Polish name, uh, about secure computations in decentralized environments. So this was a talk that, that uh, earlier version of which was at the uh, NDSS uh, DIS workshop, and uh, we thought was interesting enough uh, for us to look at. And at the end, don't, don't go away before the end. Um, we will have a quick look at meeting planning. In this case, we will mostly look at the meeting we will have tomorrow with W3C and uh, OCF. Okay, so just to, to remind people what the research group uh, is about, uh, who here is new to the research group, has not been to a previous meeting. Okay, so let me quickly say why we are here. Uh, we care about uh, a true Internet of Things, uh, which means uh, an Internet where things, including low resource nodes, nodes with very little computational ability and power, 
can communicate among themselves and with the wider internet. Um, so uh, we are looking at issues in this area, in particular when there are opportunities for IETF standardization, or I should add for cooperation with other SDA, SDOs, for others, uh, with other standards developing organizations uh, to, to make them happen. So we don't usually do radios here. We sometimes have to look at the radios if they behave, behave strangely. I will have a slide on that in a minute. Um, but we normally start at the IP adaptation layer and uh, end in the, the hearts and minds of end users. So this is about the range we are trying to, to uh, cover here. That includes security because nothing in the IoT can work without security. Um, so recently we uh, have had a big focus on uh, semantic and hypermedia interoperability and we, we have uh, had a couple of uh, meetings under the name uh, WISHI, uh, one physical and, and several uh, over the internet. Uh, we also have a number of uh, drafts and uh, the most important one is uh, the IoT security. Uh, considerations draft which uh, just entered IESG, IRSG last call. Uh, we had a workshop at NDSS on decentralized IoT security and standards. I quickly report about that in a minute. Um, we had an interesting side meeting. Uh, so essentially, we, you know all these sums about how many people fit into a phone box. Of course, these don't work anymore because there are no phone boxes anymore. Um, so we just used a meeting room for the same uh, thing and had a side meeting with 29 people in the room Waterloo, which is about the size of the screen. And uh, finally, we uh, worked with uh, OCF. Uh, we, we are having uh, something like every six months a physical meeting and we had uh, meetings in between, uh, in particular this time to talk about security and the ACE uh, activity. Okay, let me quickly say something about the NDSS this workshop. Of course, those of you who work in security know that NDSS is one of the uh, leading security conferences. Uh, they usually have a couple of workshops associated with them, and this time we managed to land a workshop on decentralized IoT security and standards. Uh, and uh, this was about uh, combining two views, one that you actually have to have standards to get IoT security, and the other that IoT security often will not be based on centralized approaches, but will require decentralized or non-centralized uh, approaches. So we had 12 papers. <coughs> Uh, which are still in the process of, of uh, being published. So it will take until about mid-April until you can download them. Um, these ranged from a security analysis of current IETF work to, to much more speculative uh, ideas. And yes, we uh, discussed blockchain. Um, and uh, yeah, one, one of the talks uh, we actually have uh, asked the author to come here uh, because he's uh, based in, in London and uh, tell us about it. So that will be later in this meeting. So what are we going to do next? Tomorrow we will meet in Prague with OCF and W3C Where of Things. So OCF is the Open Connectivity Foundation, the organization that resulted from the merger of uh, OIC UPNP and the All Scene Alliance, and uh, they, they are doing uh, very interesting standardization work, and they are a he heavy user of IETF uh, technologies. So it's a good thing to uh, talk to them, and we will talk in particular about requirements they have on our standards. So that is that is really important for us. Uh, we have about uh, in about a monthly cadence. Uh, wishy calls where we try to move forward on, on the work that this uh, workshop, which was in Prague, Prague by the way, 
uh, started. Uh, we, as I said, we have uh, WebEx meetings with OCF. Maybe we will have further face-to-face -face meetings uh, with OCF. So I, I personally will be at one of the next uh, plug test events of uh, OCF. So th that's one organization we try to keep uh, contact on. And uh, what we uh, should also do is uh, plan what we will do in uh, Montreal. Uh, Montreal is an interesting uh, area. There are also interesting local people there that we may want to uh, uh, contact. Uh, we certainly will do more wishing related things there. There has been some discussion about distributed this discovery, which would follow a little bit the theme that we had at the uh, this workshop, but uh, this uh, still has to be defined. Um, the documents of the research group, uh, we have been working on a document uh, called State of the Art and Challenges for the IoT Security, better known as uh, Security Considerations. Do you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, Padu from Nokia. Uh, so in terms of these uh, joint meetings, it may be interesting also to have a joint call with a uh, joint sessions with the uh, OMA. Uh, we have a July, we have a test fest in Seoul, which is uh, done by TTA. Uh, it's an organization, standardized test standardization organization in Korea. It may be interesting to showcase some of this and also participate in the lightweight m 2 test fest there. Uh, that may be a suggestion. That's definitely a good idea. Do you know which week that, that is on? I think it is 17 to 23, if I'm not, Oops. my mind is not. Uh, I think that's the ITF week. No, no, that's the previous week. The previous week to ITF is where we are meeting in Seoul. Okay. Uh, so that's like my Monday to Thursday, so that we are breaking on Friday, so that people like Hannah can travel and hopefully. Good, good planning, yeah, very nice. Okay. But yeah. Um, OMA is definitely is one of the organizations that, that we have been cooperating with at, at IHEF. So, for instance, one of the co-op flood tests was hosted by, by OMA, which was really useful because in the process we learned much more about the, the lightweight and uh, specification, which was pretty young at the time. Uh, so we, it certainly makes sense to, to deepen that. Okay, so um, back to the documents. We uh, got very nice reviews, in particular from Jim Shard and, and Stephen Farrell. Uh, we got lots of discussion on the list, and we are now going into IRSG review. And uh, this is always a good time uh, for, for uh, people to actually look at the document and uh, yeah, see whether it, it covers uh, their requirements, and maybe even learn from it if we don't, didn't did our job. Well, so the other document that is nearing completion is uh, called RESTful Design for IoT. Um, so this essentially takes the uh, well-known architectural style that is underlying the HTTP protocol and, and uh, much of the web work and explaining how to use this for Internet of Things applications. Because there are some things that, that may just not be very intuitive uh, here. So that is a document that is uh, pretty far advanced. Um, there, there is a pull request in review right now. We develop our documents on uh, based on Git technology. So we, we use something like pull requests or merge requests um, uh, to uh, process larger changes. And there is also an issue right now that we have to cover the, the new patch and fetch methods that are defined in RFC 8132, is that the right number? Um, that, that those are not yet covered in the document. Okay, so... Uh, Laura, that? Laura, do you want to say something? Okay, so as, as Karsten said, we um, we tried to fit 30-some people in a room dimensioned for about 10 or 12. Um, other than that, the meeting went very well. There is a draft about some of these issues, but the main idea is that when we put administratively independent IoT applications, so 
something I put in my apartment, something you deploy in your apartment, no administrative relationship between them. We lose packets because of radio interference, and that's not the IETF's problem. But what some recent research results suggest is that the protocols are inducing kind of timing behaviors, sensitivity to the loss of certain kinds of packets that, are exas that exacerbate these problems. And we can get kind of severe performance degradation at the protocol level. Um, and potentially that is something that, that we need to think about at this layer. Right now, there don't seem to be good tools, um, use simulators, test beds that help us evaluate these sort of multi-network scenarios where we have independent networks sharing the channel. Um, and just some of the things we discussed. Um, this touches potentially a number of IETF protocols, anything that's touching these MAC layers, um, 6LOW, 6TISH. Um, some other things that came into the discussion, this is obviously somewhere on the IETF, IEEE border. Clearly the MAC has to do most of the work here, but at administratively independent networks, the MAC only has kind of limited abilities to isolate, um, isolate the networks in, in the link sense. Um, so I think there are some roles for, for IETF protocols to, to try to understand the performance in this environment and potentially try to make some improvements. Um, some folks also raised various possibilities for active or explicit coordination um, via high-level protocols. Um, so there is a draft, um, and I encourage people to be interested in this. Thank you. Um, Gabriel Montenegro. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on this research, because, um, uh, for example, in in Europe, the ISM bands require listen before talk. Not that's not required in the U.S. and many other in some other places, but most. That's why 3GPP with co and coexistence problems in, uh, in bands that are typically used by Wi-Fi assume LBT and, and builds on top of that. So, my question is: Is this research that you're pointing at? Does it, does it assume uh, LBT is in place or not? Or, or is it that even with LBT, you still have all these, all these effects? So basically what, what we are trying to do here is, is uh, point out a problem. So th there is some initial research, but th the main conclusion from that is uh, we need more research. Uh, so it's, it's not yet trying to answer all the, the questions. Um, so essentially, we are, we are building this this uh, a transportation system for for cars that, that work on an, an empty highway. But in reality, we we have hundreds of SSIDs and apartment buildings and, and uh, all kinds of uh, gardening systems and whatever that, that see each other in the wild, which never have been tested for that. And and um, yeah, some things are tested. But uh, in, in th there are a lot of situations that are just very hard to test in today's test beds and, and so on. Um, so the, the, the idea is to just look at uh, the, the situation and find out what other research can we get started based on the fact that we are no longer in the phase where we have a single thing that, that has a couple of nodes around it, but we have independently administrated a network suddenly meeting in, in the wild. Okay. And there are surprises. So, so Laura's research shows, shows there are surprises. What yeah. other surprises are in store? We don't know. We don't have the research. Yeah, my, really my, my only suggestion would be to look at it in a, from a practical point of view in many regulatory environments. It, it yeah. won't be completely blank. There is there some is. rules already in place. It would be good to know in those places. Uh, there is a draft. Some of this is discussed okay. in, the, in, the, in the draft. Um, I think maybe since this wasn't a main topic for the meeting, Karsten, it's up to, I'm happy to take discussion. Um, Karsten, if you want to move on to the main program, I'm happy to refer people to the draft well, and mailing list. Let's, let's okay, I, like I said, okay. Thanks, Juan Carlos Uniga, Sigfox. So yeah, just responding to, to Gabriel, because I guess uh, you didn't have the, the opportunity to, to be in the discussion, but you're, you're right, all, all those points were, were definitely part, part of the discussion. There's multiple regulatory domains. If we focus, let's say, on ISM bands, there's different rules on every country on how you operate on these ISM bands. Not all these protocols follow the same MAC, for instance. Uh, so here we talk about IEEE, that's just part of it. Some some protocols may not be following the same. As long as they comply to the regulation, they are 
legal to operate in this country, but they may not be legal to operate in this other country. However, I think uh, at least the take that I that I had from from the discussion is there's still some potential to to share some knowledge at higher layers, and and that's why we, there, there's a, a pointer there to the white uh, spaces uh, protocol that was uh, the pause protocol that was defined uh, before, where yeah, I mean. Through the internet, you can get some knowledge that could be useful for your area, and maybe these bands, the, the, sorry, these operators are, are are using or either private networks, public networks, uh, standardized protocols, or uh, from different entities. But still, there could be some interesting information. Like I don't know, to me, it sounds like a level of noise in this region, something that doesn't touch on privacy necessarily, but some some useful information that could help me operate better. You know, there, probably, you know, you can do something in, 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 in IP at the IP le level and communicate networks that may or may not be connected to the internet. Maybe at the administrative level, not at the device level, but, but Let, still, I think there's design the solutions uh, today. But uh, yeah, I think there are more interesting things that you know. Elite, do you have 30 seconds? Yeah, about th just a little less. Um, the, the first question is uh, where and how do you want to continue your conversation? On the research group mailing list. Okay. And the second question is, uh, within that draft, um, is there a, a data collection a methodology that's recommended to, to try and characterize the problem a little bit more? Um, so the, the document really kind of forces on, focuses on kind of laying out the challenges systematically. It points to a couple of research results, both mine and other people's. Um, the main point in the document um, is that I recommend that um, the TTTRG or, or some other um, mechanism, we try to understand what we would like to have for some practices for evaluating how the IETF protocols, you know, six low, six T -ish role perform in this environment. We, we, we need to have a better understanding. That, okay. That's really what the, the so document says. I apologize for, for following up, but um, even before we make recommendations about uh, protocols, right? The, I think the first step is we, we might make sense. I agree with you on the understanding. As part of getting the understanding, it would be used to, useful to have some sort of uh, data collection slash analysis methodology so that we can better characterize the yeah, problem. Th th and this I is a good place to there. do that. I think we're not even there yet. I'm not, I'm not sure as a community we even know what we want to know. OK. So we, we really have to finish this uh, one, topic. We have just 30 minutes one second to say, you, second. you really need to look, and I think you're already looking at LP1, and there you have like an 80, like in, in all the, the, the work, uh, working group and the things that are getting, that we're discussing there. That's really a place to, to do, and there are a lot of interesting topics there. So all thanks for this one. This, this touches, so this touches I'm sorry. <coughs> yeah, this, this touches a lot of groups. Right now, mm -hmm. it's at T to TRG. There, there may be some discussion where where or whether that needs to go somewhere else, but I think not now because Karsten has a program. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. So yeah, you can expect to hear more about that uh, in the future. So let's uh, dive in, into the agenda after these uh, first words. So next is Michael with a report from the Rishi and Hackathon activities. No. Right, we had a, uh, so I'm going to report on the, uh, the WISHI part of the Thing to Thing research group. WISHI is the workshop on IoT and semantic hypermedia interoperability. And we've actually had eight calls since the, the IETF 101 because we've had a lot of activity in planning this uh, of our participation in the hackathon. And um, we really covered a diverse set of topics around semantics and hypermedia. Um, I'm probably not gonna try to read through everything here, but essentially we looked at sort of top to bottom. So what is, what is the nature of abstract semantics? How do we wanna describe things in a way that's protocol neutral? How do we do semantic annotation? Um, how do we connect with RDF ontologies and other data, uh, data sets that are um, that are around like these third party vocabularies. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the QUDT, SOSA, SSN that are fairly hard to use and how do we make them easier to use? How do we, how do we integrate semantic metadata into the system? Where does it go and, and you know, who uses it? How do they use it? 
Um, this idea of a layered semantic stack, there may be different semantics at different layers in the stack at different protocol levels. Um, we looked at um, basically how to, um, how to work with other SDOs around semantic interoperability and also, uh, you know, some of the <clears throat> more mundane sounding, sounding stuff like data types of engineering units, which is still, you know, really part of the picture. So from, from top to bottom. <laughs> so um, the goals for this, this one, and we're probably going to have a series of these, but the goals for this is the second hackathon, but this is the first hands-on where we brought hardware and tried to make it do things. Um, bringing the diverse things together to interoperate. And we wanted to start focusing on, you know, where you would start in, in an application workflow with doing discovery and semantic-based discovery and uh, um, software adaptation to different data models and different protocols. And that's, that's generally the theme. For this one, we had HTTP, CoAP, and MQTT protocols involved. I'm not sure anyone used the MQTT, but we used CoAP and HTTP. Uh, we, we started with really simple application scenarios like can a signal input like a motion sensor turn a light on and off just for a very, very basic orchestration. And the implementations that people brought were uh, W3C Web of Things, um, which we'll talk more about. There was a Yang Komai, there was a Komai based uh, implementation, tried to interoperate. There was a OMA lightweight M2M uh, client and server, and there were some various ad hoc device APIs, protocols, just a basic REST API, like you might see from various connected devices that don't follow any particular standard, but they still use HTTP and they still have a, a REST-ish uh, sort of API. So um, and we looked at connected home and automotive domains. And the idea was, you know, how do we make them work together? What's the technology that we use? And we started using some of the stuff from the W3C Web of Things group, because uh, a lot of the goals and objectives are very similar. So we brought that, uh, that technology in, and we'll talk more about that. But um, what we ended up with were being able to generate thing descriptions, which is a sort of W3C Web of Things metadata format from uh, lightweight M2M instances that we could find on a lightweight M2M server. We, uh, we, uh, we started integrating Komai uh, with thing descriptions. So to show that you don't really have to have any particular kind of protocol, what, what's the range of protocols that can be connected to. We, uh, we brought a thing directory and we stored thing descriptions in the thing directory. I'll, I'll show more about what that, that whole thing looked like. And then we had, a, at the end, we had the Web of Things implementation communicating with these different uh, device implementations and different protocols. So thing description was, was what we used as the metadata, common metadata format here. And it's basically a media type with RDF. It describes the abstract inter interactions with things, so, you know, read the temperature, lock the door, this sort of thing. And it also binds those abstract uh, um, interactions to concrete instances of things that, that implement those interactions. So, you know, the, um, <clears throat> things like the data shape, payload structure, data types, and uh, transfer layer instructions, like use this protocol scheme, use this method, use these options. And so the applications use abstract interactions to, uh, to interact with things so they're decoupled from the underlying implementation. So the idea is you have one application talking with many different protocols and really doesn't need to know what the underlying protocol is. Um, so here's, here's a little picture that illustrates this. Um, thing description has both semantic annotation, high level information models and capabilities like what do you want to do in an abstract sense and protocol binding, sort of from the device specific protocols, <coughs> how do you do it? Uh, you know, OCF, lightweight MGM, if so, dot, dot. These are all based on co-app, but they use co-app quite a bit differently. There's, there's not an easy way to, uh, to uh, use them all in a single application without doing some adaptation. And so that's what we do with thing description is that's up, pardon me. 
a format for adaptation uh, between these different protocols. So Thing Directory is what we used in the, in the hackathon to, as a central registry of these Thing descriptions. So basically, um, each, each device or connected Thing registers its Thing description in the Thing Directory, and then applications can discover them and find them using semantic queries. And Thing Directory uses the same protocol as uh, Core Resource Directory. So it's the same sort of handshake protocol with uploading the thing and, and having to refresh it and being able to go in and do uh, URI queries on it to find uh, what you want to look for. So um, there was one or more. We basically used, I think, one Thing Directory, but there could be one or more. But these are the well-known entry points to the system. You go to the Thing Directory find your thing descriptions, and that tells you everything you need to know uh, about what that device does, what that thing does, and how to interact with it. Uh, right. So, oh, here we go. So this is sort of a schematic of what, what sort of roles and services are available. And uh, connected devices register with thing directory and then applications. <laughs> Buttons are a little small. Applications discover them. Um, after that, the application might interact directly with the connected thing, or it might be interacting through some intermediary like a proxy or a pub sub broker. And if it was a pub sub broker, there, there's some coordination here to register in Thing Directory the address of the pub sub broker and how to communicate with it as opposed to the, the thing itself. And some of these, like uh, my entries, for example, and some others registered both. Uh, if an application is on the LAN, it can find and interact with the device directly. <clears throat> if the application is on the internet at large, it can find a proxy and interact there. And the thing description just had more than one uh, entry point for, for doing that, one for the local LAN and one for uh, reachable over the internet. So here's some examples. Um, Sort of showing that the same format, how the uh, how the Yang implementation worked. It, it fed its stuff to a thing directory, and then the the Serbian, which is where the application runs, can then access the device. Same thing with an HTTP device that uh, might have some ad hoc protocol, but but restish. It registers the TD, and then the application can <laughs> discover from the TD and interact with the device. What happened? Oh, okay. Uh, Martin, um, <clears throat> could you get back? Could yes. you go back one slide and explain a little bit what the entities are? So, um, so the HTTP, the green box, is that the IoT device? The, the green box is that the IoT device? That could be the device, or that could be an, an agent on behalf of the device. Okay, mm -hmm. but which one? So I'm trying to make sense out of this. I understand that. Uh, the, the thing directory is the directory that you mm -hmm. previously explained. Uh, which one corresponds now to the application sort of like uh, and to the connected thing and the intermediaries on the next slide? So like here, w so, so I see the directory, thing directory, which one is now the client that wants to access some data from the IoT device? Is the COMI device, is that the IoT device and, and the application is the uh, uh, W3C Web of Things uh, Serbian, is that true? Yes, yes. I, and where's the mm. proxy here? Sorry? And the proxy it doesn't exist here. So, well, sorry. This is acting as the proxy for the device. The Serbian is essentially an application proxy for the device. So the Serbian interprets the, the uh, transfer layer instructions from the thing description that it got from the thing directory, and it uses those to access the device. So in the W3C Serbian software, we already have the adaptation uh, for the protocol for the for the transfer layer. So we use that as as the application proxy. Yeah. So I, the Serbian, I, think, I think you have to update the slides to get them in line with the architecture picture right. because there's one entity that I'm apparently missing and some errors may mm -hmm. be missing as well, because in a previous slide, the, the IoT device uh, registered itself at the um, directory directly. In this case, it doesn't. 
And there's no application. Uh, um, so, Hannes, what, only one clarification here. Uh, in, in the case of the hackathon, the green box was, for example, just a file. So it was not necessarily even created by the device. No, no, I'm, I'm in the saying, in the case get, of, the, get the slides in sync so that uh, someone understands. It. Yes, that's definitely going to be helpful. Uh, but the, these slides are more showing the architecture on the hackathon, which is not fully the same as the, uh, let's say, ideal architecture. But this is how the hackathon setup was, was made. And the green boxes in general are the new ones that were built uh, for the hackathon purpose. Here's a better picture to show a lot of these things. So, for example, here, the uh, lightweight M2M device going through the lightweight M2M server and this discovery adapter will discover things on the lightweight M2M server and register them with the thing directory. So that shows the whole loop. That wasn't shown on the other slides, unfortunately. So I, I take it a good point. Well, we should fix those up to make maybe put something like this a little more up front. So in the same way for the HT. So here it shows the device isn't registering this. The device is doing lightweight M2M to, -M to the lightweight M2M -M server. It only needs to have these tiny short URIs and numeric identifiers and all of that. Then this, this piece goes in and expands them and knows how to create all of the semantic annotation based on its knowledge of you know, lightweight M to M number codes and if so, smart objects and what have you. And then, and then the servient can, can say, oh, I'm looking for a temperature sensor and can find this. And then from the transfer layer instructions knows how to interact with the device. And the same thing for the HTTP and COMI devices, but we didn't show the whole loop of how. So the HTTP device uh, was a Raspberry Pi. It can just, it can, it can basically go directly and register its it's things with the thing directory. Also, we had some cloud services that had, you know, we're running on a DigitalOcean instance that had enough you know, CPU and, and enough resources to be able to go and both expose the devices and, and create the semantic uh, descriptors and register them. All right. So next steps, um, we're, we're gonna go, uh, we want to go look at semantic annotation and discovery like the thing directory case, but using core RD and link format. <clears throat> so how can we semantically annotate uh, web links with the same information to enable the same sort of discovery on a general web linking format? We want to look at different uh, end device protocols and data models. So, you know, things like BACnet even are, are part of this, right? Um, more automation of the semantic queries because we're mapping the Sparkle endpoint to URIs. How do we how do we make it easy to generate those? Um, <clears throat> Michael, um, when you do, did the mapping from, let's say, lightweight M2M to uh, thing description from the W3C or, or other, uh, like COMI to, to that, how was, was that uh, possible without uh, losing some of the semantic or like, um, because that has always been a challenge. Like we have all these different activities and we are piling on more and more standards activities on different, descriptions and then it becomes very difficult to map them to each other without uh, losing some of the semantics of it. So how, what was that? What was the experience? Obviously you used to you started with a simple scenario that presumably everyone has, but. Well, when we're starting, when we're using these devices that are light bulbs and temperature sensors and stuff, there's not much semantic, there's not any semantic box. In fact, the, uh, the semantic um, annotations pretty much have, have a way of describing all of the what you want to do mm. sort of sort of things and that's all extensible so if you need more affordances like what's the timing of changing the brightness of a light mm. or things like that those those are all part of that and can be added in the abstract because we don't have to describe specific protocol features it's sort of easier to to cover the broad field semantically right but a lot but, of the differences uh, are in the protocols yeah but one of the the challenge or one of the observation that we learned from the IOTC workshop was uh, you can't just look at the uh, data model but you also have to look at the interaction model uh, because they are closely coupled together somehow and so it would be interesting to go from the basic example to something a little bit more sophisticated like actuators maybe uh, other more complicated things and see how well that works uh, I would be curious on what the result is uh, Matthias Kovac Siemens um, to, to help out uh, Michael a bit here. So um, there are different tracks going on. So in, in the WQC Web of Things, 
um, we look exactly at these interaction models uh, that have partly describing what protocols are used, what are basically the, the abstract um, yeah, operations that you perform. Um, there we found kind of this narrow waste of properties, actions, and events that cover from a programming model perspective, basically what you can do. And um, so we, we can read out some state, uh, we can write to some state if this is allowed in this particular ecosystem. Uh, we can call um, these, these actions that um, often yeah, correspond to something that goes on for a certain time. Um, some others might be RPC based, so there's also this coverage and we can cover uh, whenever a device can asynchronously send something to, to the client. Um, so there we have this, this core model in the thing description, so there's a, a formal model behind uh, the description uh, document itself. And uh, this is then uh, extended a bit by the binding templates that Michael was mentioning. So in this example here, um, the, the common protocol was co-op. So we are able to describe uh, the methods that can be used uh, by co-op. We can describe if there are some specific options that are used for the protocol. And uh, this is uh, basically noted down uniformly in the thing description. So we can describe the differences there. What, I, what I'm most interested in is reading up on some of that experience on when you did that i understand like there are always some new standards efforts i don't i don't uh necessarily care about them i want to learn like did those things that you tried to accomplish actually work out or, like where are the problems uh and maybe maybe you've created those uh descriptions already yeah so for the descriptions um a big part of what i could explain until now uh, is documented in the w3c document so there are the the drafts out there I'm sure the W3C document will not explain your experience with the hackathon on mapping uh, lightweight M2M to, M to the thing description. Right. Okay, this part explicitly about that um, would be probably a, a report from this hackathon, which was just the last weekend, and I don't know how much time you had. Um, but definitely, this is something we are also working on. So there is uh, another plug fest happening at the W3C face to face, uh, the upcoming weekend where also again uh, people from different um, organizations come. Um, there will be some reporting on that. And the last thing I just wanted to add because you asked about the semantic level. So this is something that goes on top and that uh, is something that we're currently uh, collecting. So it's uh, looking into, okay, um, what in, um, kind of semantic interactions do we have in the different ecosystems and actually listing this down and uh, creating vocabulary but there we need um, basically uh, yeah a good overview of what is out there um, maybe a activity to point to is the iot schema.org uh, where the kind of the the ones that are easy to identify because they occur across all these ecosystems are uh, being collected again in some kind of uniform format that uh, can apply over these different ecosystems So uh, Ar Ar from the floor. So quickly comment on the like with MDM experience. Um, it was very simple thing that we did so far. So for, for sure we're going to be learning more on the how well the semantics map. So right now what the, the prototype did is that it queries from the management server what kind of devices are registered there, what are the URIs that are exposed, and it maps them to thing, thing, thing description. What will be the next steps is to do the semantic mapping and then figure out like how much tools, how much vocabulary do we have to, to get uh, how, how close we can get the Ipsos semantics. But it's, um, it's a journey, so we'll keep you posted. So uh, these look like really good next steps. I really appreciate you know where you're going. But um, before you get to the more complex devices, um, I think it might be useful also to expand out your um, experiments with a more complex model of the existing devices. That is to say, uh, Hannes's work with ACE and other things. So. One of the challenges that, when I talk to um, my partners in all this, by the way, I'm Elliot, I work at Cisco. Um, the moment we add in an authorization model, it gets, um, even with the simplest devices, it gets pretty complex. And I, would, I think that's an, a great area for discovery. I realize I'm, I'm saying this without saying I'm gonna do it, okay, but uh, it's just, I, we're going through this now for very simple cases and they're turning very complex. Even, you know, even trying to get something to market is very hard. Right now. So that's, that's a really good point. And um, <clears throat> what we're working on in W3C and probably need to look at here also, we're looking at how do we create security models for individual endpoints so you can authorize and, and learn how to um, securely communicate with them. And we're sort of seeing that as a next step, but not far behind. 
So yeah, are we using access control entries? How do you generate the, the correct token subject role for our back? You know, all of those things, we're trying to work that into the next uh, next phase of design for, for that. Mason and I here in Brevard City of Essex. Uh, I'm wondering uh, how big is the resource directory in uh, the thing directory in here? Uh, are you looking at the state? Uh, what sort of scale are we talking in here? Is it like a local network of things? Um, are you talking about something a bit bigger? What's the size in here? Well, I, I think a thing directory would be like a scalable web service or a local a thing that you would have on your router on your LAN, just like a resource directory. So, so is that going to interact remotely? Is that going to interact remotely with other uh, thing directories? Um, what, what sort of scale are we looking at here? Yeah, federation of thing directories we haven't, haven't really um, tried to work with, but um, there should be a way to create scalable services that provide this. Right. Either so, through microservices or through some federation of multiple instances of directories. So, so, so on a, on a more, um, on a, so what's the sort of discovery protocol are we looking at? Is it something innovative or is it, are you looking at some of existing protocols? Sparkle endpoint. Sparkle, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so basically that's, it's all really been covered. The, the one thing I wanted to say that we, we find we're looking at uh, more diverse models. We're looking at an automotive model. And the automotive model is very dependent on being able to understand the feature of interest that a thing is bound to. So if I have a door switch, the automotive model really requires us to say which door that is and that it's a door. And, and that's something that we don't have in the IoT schema uh, on, on definition model. Yet, but that's uh, again the next thing we want to add is features of interest, and that that basically creates a whole discovery system. What do I want to do? What which thing do I want to affect, and then and then how do I do it? I think I'm out of time. So. Yeah, thank you. So as um, uh, I said, this activity is going on. So this was just an intermediate status report. And now for something completely different. Turn the screen or less, you can see the time and Yes. Hello. Um, yeah, so indeed something completely different. Um, I'm going to talk about a research project that uh, is being developed in my team right now that allows us to do deep learning on microcontrollers, which I think is one of the most exciting um, projects that we can be doing right now. Um, my name is Jan Jungbaum. Uh, I am developer evangelist at ARM. And one of the first times that I was running into micro or like deep learning in the field was about a year ago. Um, and that was uh, here in the University of, uh, of Technology in Arusha, Tanzania. And in there, I was teaching at a summer school where a bunch of data scientists, mostly mathematics, uh, master students and PhDs got together to look at the problems that they had within their society um, and how they could apply deep learning or machine learning to these problems. Um, and I went there as the IoT guy. So actually, we went to the field. So this was the conference was six days. So during that time, we did IoT training, like how do you build devices? Um, how do you, where do you store the data? What do you do with it? And after we actually went into the field. So we went to dairy farms or with the chicken farms actually capturing data that then was published as an open data set that a variety of universities then used. So uh, a university in Kenya was actually using the, the samples that we generated during that, during that workshop. Um, and I'm returning in May, I'm very happy about it, it's called Data Science Africa. Um, we're going to do uh, eight days, 100 students, three field, project, three field work projects, and again, just actually building something and uh, getting this technology in the hands of students. And that's very cool. Now. If I think about machine learning, what I think about is large sets, large data centers full of clusters of GPUs doing my training and crunching Facebook posts to resell them to Cambridge Analytics guys. Um, um, but if we're, if we're taking one step back, there are actually a lot of the value of machine learning uh, is added if we can run all these algorithms, not in a big data center, but rather on very small edge nodes. So one of the cool projects that we've seen in the last year is uh, sensor fusion, where you combine a number of relatively cheap sensors 
um, and get data points from all of those sensors. And on these these points are not worth that much. So you can't infer much from it. But if you combine a lot of cheap sensors together, you create like this, was the guys at Jirat called a super sensor. So there's a, there's a really good video on that link. The, the slides will be published after this where they all kinds of stuff that happens in the house, like stuff like a faucet turns on, they can detect from this very, very small group of sensors. And that's all just because of training on a variety of different sensors at the same time in the school. Um, another thing is what happens, what, what Google is doing with their keyboards on Android, uh, a technique called federated learning. Now, there's a, there's a local model running on the Android phones um, that gets locally trained as well. But what you don't want to do is send raw training data. Because preferably, if I'm, if I'm a keyboard manufacturer, I want to get data from all my users and get that back and refine my global model that I then push out to all the Android phones. But I don't want to push any raw data into the cloud because there might be all kinds of privacy aspects in there. Um, plus, you know, if I'm looking at how often I type, it costs quite a bit of bandwidth to just stream that upwards. So what Google is doing is they have a local model. They keep refining that. And they're sending them the changes in the weights uh, in the model back to the cloud. And they use that from all the people to refine their global model. So it's this hybrid model where you do some training locally and then take the learnings that you do in that model and push it upwards uh, and update your global model that runs somewhere on a cluster of GPUs. Uh, another thing is for a bunch of uh, file formats, we're really good at compression. If I draw a number or I draw a letter, then I don't need to send the whole image. I can just say, okay, well, that's an A, and I just send one byte over the line. Um, but if we're going to look at larger data sets or, or interesting stuff that happens all around us, then I don't have a model that can compress the data straight away. So this thing called autoencoding, um, where, you, where you basically have a deep learning model that's going to keep producing features up until the moment that it has its own compression format, and you have the model on the other side where it can decompress that and basically give you a learned representation of what you try to send it. This is a model where the deep learning model itself is going to figure out an encoding scheme for this, creating very, very interesting um, compression schemes that we didn't devise before for very localized sets of data. Um, this is very important if you look at low power wide area networks like Sigfox, like LoRa, where your uplink capacity is very limited. And sending a compressed version of whatever you're trying to send, even though it's a very complex problem, is worth a lot. And then the last thing here, so this is a, this is a photo from, um, from the work week that we did last year in, in Tanzania. It's like offline self-contained systems. What if you want to do something in an area where there is no internet? Um, if I'm going to deploy a machine learning model on a dairy farm somewhere in Tanzania where the average income is under $100 a month and there's no internet, I'm not going to put down a cluster of GPUs to actually do some deep learning, um, some deep learning models there. But I am very interested in what machine learning can bring to me. So one of the things that we wanted to, sh to detect is, can we see if a cow is in heat at any point based on data that we get straight from this cow's skin? And that's important for the farmers because a semen sample is about 2 to $4. And two to four dollars is a lot of money, so you only want to put that in if you have the highest chance the cow is actually getting pregnant. Um, there's a little blog post about that there, pretty interesting. Um, the other thing is there's some research, and it depends a little bit on what you try to do, what kind of inferencing you want to do, where um, doing it on the edge is actually a lot faster because you don't need to hold a round trip to the clouds, and especially if you think about LP WANs, might be even harder where actually the energy per inference is lower on edge versus cloud. So this was um, Nan Wang, she was doing her PhD uh, uh, internship at ARM, and she was looking at some um, inferencing numbers, and this was for a very simple environmental monitoring system, where she actually found that the energy per inference of doing it on the edge, even though it takes relatively longer and more cycles, uh, was over 10 times more efficient. For other stuff like image, image recognition or video or object recognition in videos might be the other way around. But there are use cases we're doing it on the edge, just more efficient. Um, now, if we have anything on the edge, it's not going to be a computer. It's not going to be a Raspberry Pi. It's going to be a microcontroller. So 
I assume everyone knows what a microcontroller is. Can I figure it out? Well, I say, so they're, they're small, they're cheap, and they're efficient. I mean, if they don't do anything, they just basically don't consume any memory either. But the downside is slow, and very limited memory. Um, so that prompted us within ARM, or a couple of guys within ARM in our research, um, not in our complete research team, but a bit of the practical end, to come up with a library to do deep learning on these type of devices, deep learning on microcontrollers. And that's the, the MicroTensor project. So MicroTensor is an open source library. It's Apache 2 licensed, specifically made to run TensorFlow models. So models that you normally train on your GPUs that you then run directly on a microcontroller. So it only does at this point classification, so no training. So what you do is you push a trained model that you train in TensorFlow down to the microcontroller, and after that you can do classification. Um, with a couple of really smart tricks, we are able to do a classification of a lot of machine learning models in under 256k of RAM. So that includes stuff like Android and digit recognition, which I'll show in a video, but even object classification in videos. I think it's a, it's a really good step forward. I think it's really cool. It, this enables all kinds of incredibly interesting use cases without having to either upstream all your raw data to the cloud or do your inferencing on a really expensive machine. So it's developed, it's not an ARM project per se. Um, it originated from ARM. Um, these are the four core contributors. Uh, as you can see, I'm not there. Uh, Neil, Neil is actually in my team. He's the developer evangelist, uh, Internet of Things for APAC. Um, I helped the team a little bit, so I wrote the simulator for this, so it makes it a little bit easier to develop, but I'm not part of the core team. Also not a machine learningist, machine data scientist, anything. Um, but it's very fun. If after a talk you're like, hey, shit, I want to develop on that, feel free. You know, four people in a core team, of which none of them is their full-time job to actually develop this. Um, we, we definitely welcome contributions. So just listen, get up. So here's a, here's a demonstration. And what we're going to do here is draw something on touch screen, a banana for scale. And uh, after that, it will, do, uh, it will basically tell you what you just drawn on it. So I hope it's visible from the back, because I was expecting a little bit larger screen. So this is my controller, this 200 megahertz MCU. Um, that's three. Zoom in, and there's the three. Uh, and this has a 300 something K of RAM, and that includes the driver touchscreen. Yeah, there's an eight. So this is a basic handwritten digit recognition running on a microcontroller in, well, less than 256K of RAM, which is in school. So what are we seeing here? Um, it's essentially the, the hello world of machine learning. Um, this is the MNIST data set, which consists of 60,000 images of handwritten digits. Um, all these drawings are downscaled to 28 by 28 pixels um, and then thrown through a, through, through a deep learning model where you do supervised learning because uh, with backpropagation. And the idea there is um, in supervised learning, you, you try to map a set of inputs to their correct outputs. And because we already have the correct output for all those numbers, because they're tagged with the actual number that we expect, you use backpropagation to fix models in the uh, model by actually working backwards. Um, so this is trained in TensorFlow, just on a normal computer. Um, the script is listed there, so you can run it yourself. Um, and when we do the classification, because that is what we're doing in the microcontroller, not the training, um, we take whatever we just put in on the touch screen. We rotate it so it's, the, it's upwards. Um, we remove the white space, and then we scale it down to 28 by 28 pixels, just as we have in the training set. Um, and 28 by 28 pixels gives us 784 neurons. So every pixel is a neuron. So it's downscaled, black and white, 28 by 28, gives us a vector of 784 neurons. Um, in the end, we get an output, so it's a single neuron. So that's what we need to work back with. We need to scale 784 neurons down to one. Um, just before we have the output, we have an output layer, which is 10 potential outputs, because there are 10 numbers, 0 to 9. And then we run softmax on it, so we only pick the one that has the highest probability of actually matching. Um, in there, then we run um, 
So what's kind of important is that what we do when we jump from the input layer to the hidden layer, so all of these neurons are connected on both the input layer and the hidden layer, um, just before we do a matrix multiplication with a known trainings, a known set of data that we know from the training set, uh, with a little bit of bias, which you also know because we trained this model and then we run an activation function, we do that twice. We can talk about like the actual details of this uh, later. Now, why is this important? Um, because how are we going to run this on a microcontroller? This looks hard. I thought this kid was cool. Um, so what's important is this matrix multiplication table because that is what um, that's kind of drives the memory usage of this model. So we have on the left side 784 input neurons. And you have a hidden layer of 128 and a hidden layer of 64 and, a hidden, and then an output, well, actually a hidden layer of 10 and an output layer of 1. Holding that all in memory, um, that's what we want to reduce. Because for a lot of machine learning models during classification, RAM usage is the thing that just explodes. So the biggest trick that we're doing here is that we do quantization. And quantize it. typically what you hold, the weight of the neurons is held in a 32-bit float. Um, and that's completely necessary during training because it's the only way you can probably hold everything, uh, have like proper accuracy. But we figured out, and the guys in TensorFlow figured this out as well, based on research by Pete Warden, is that if instead of 32-bit floats, you use 8-bit integers, um, you have a little bit of loss in accuracy. So tested against a Cypher 10 data set, which is a object classification in video feeds, about 0.4% accuracy loss. Um, but that drastically reduces the amount of memory that we need, actually four times. So TensorFlow requires uh, floating point dequantization. So um, if, you quantize, if you quantize, you hold, you map a floating point to, to an int eight. So you hold the minimum value and the maximum value that you might have, and then you map it in between. Um, TensorFlow requires to put it back to a float whenever you're done with a neural. Uh, we worked around that because this is very slow on microcontrollers that doesn't have a floating point unit, which is a lot of them. Um, so that's a way around it. Um, and then we see the current memory usage. Uh, we're very aggressive at purging layers. So only the, if we're going from the input layer to hidden layer one, we don't load anything else in memory. So, and then you see that the, the metric multiplication table that you need in the first hidden layer is dominating the RAM usage. So for this model, we see a peak memory usage of 98 kilobytes. And that is a lot less than 256K. And we can push this even down further with a couple of other tricks that we're doing. Um, first of all, we have paging of memory for larger models. So if we see that we can't fit everything in memory because we have too many neurons at some point, or we have the metric multiplication table doesn't fit, we can page through memory. Of course, to sacrifice speed. So your classifications will go slower, but this is a way of even running these algorithms on microcontrollers that have less than 128K memory. Um, we put the complete graph in ROM. So if you have a TensorFlow model, there's, a, there's the graph, which basically describes all the layers and what to do with these layers and where you want to read the data from. We pre-compile this and put it in a read-only memory. So that saves a bunch of ROM, uh, saves a bunch of RAM, in our case, 26K. So that's great, actually. <laughs> Um, and something that we're looking into right now is that we want to take advantage of the sparsity of data. So it's going to cost a little bit of uh, accuracy, but we might win a little bit of memory with that. Um, not all the operators are there. Uh, what's the most important ones that are missing right now are convolution and pooling, which are necessary for image recognition or object recognition in video files. Um, and these operate, so we're, these are work in process. And now the operators are important because these are the same operators as in TensorFlow. So the whole idea of microtensors is that we want to keep parity with what TensorFlow is doing. So we don't want to have a new, model, new way of training your data set because all that happens currently in TensorFlow. And that's, that's really cool. Um, there's a lot of innovation there. Like there's startups now that are doing JavaScript machine learning and they back everything by TensorFlow uh, models. So we win a lot by doing that. Um, so it's going pretty soon, convolution and pooling, and then we can also do image recognition. Um, the tensors that we have right now, so in TensorFlow, everything is RAM-based because often you run this on a machine that has enough RAM. Um, a couple of ways of tricking that is that we also have flash tensors, where they can read from flash, of course, at the sacrifice of speed. Um, the sparse tensors, and there's also network tensors, which I figured might be interesting here for people in IETF. Um, 
So one of the things that we can do there is say, well, we're going to split um, part of our data set between devices, and those devices might be in a mesh, and they can all work together to actually solve this, uh, do this classification. I think it's cool. It's something that's it's a floating idea. It's nothing has been implemented, but it might be cool to have like a hundred very small devices all working together to do a classification. Of course, only if your computation is uh, costs more than actually the overhead that you have to send all the data around. Um, so the workflow. Microtensor consists of two tools, the CLI and the library. So you start with a set of data, you throw it to TensorFlow, that gives you a, a protobuf file. Then you run the UTensor CLI tools that does two things. One, it um, creates the metric multiplication tables from the trained model. So that's your, your training, your trained model, essentially. And then it generates a, a C++ and a, an APP, HPP file that contain the tensor graph. You combine it with the microtensor lib, and then you have something running on a microcontroller, and then you can put data in and get classified data out. Um, if you look at, and have you guys ever, if anyone had used TensorFlow before, but uh, you have TensorBoard, which can basically show you your current graph, um, visually represented there, and then we just put it in code here on the right, and that's, that's how we put the graph into run. Looking at time. Um, Developing can be a lot easier. We have something called the simulator. It's developed in the same team, uh, in also in my team. So we have the same MNIST data set here, and we don't want to run it on a device because it's pretty slow. And if you want to refine the way that you do classification, it's a bit annoying as well. So we have an online simulator. just runs in the browser. Um, two, three. And what it does is actually cross-compiles the complete model into JavaScript and then runs the complete in, uh, inferencing in JavaScript. And it's a really, way, really nice way of doing your development. Um, something that's new um, that has just come out is a bunch of kernel extensions for uh, Cortex-M. It's called the CMSIS NN. Uh, this is developed by ARM. And the whole idea is that it leverages the DSP and SIMD functions in your silicon if you're using Cortex-M4, Cortex-M7, or Cortex-M33. Um, and you use that to speed up a bunch of uh, operations that you normally do, like, for example, convolution or uh, relu. So we see a speed up about four to five times, which is pretty awesome because stuff that you might think is, is kind of impossible, like object classification in an image, um, becomes viable this way. Um, because of this hardware uh, acceleration, Microtensor doesn't use it right now, but it will do that very, very soon. Um, so here's a, here's a video of a Cortex-M7 device running at, I think, 300 megahertz, more or less doing uh, object recognition. So here in the left corner, you'll see the, uh, what it currently classifies. And in the right top corner, you'll see the uh, data feed from a webcam. And then it gets downsampled to, I think, 32 by 32 pixels in the color image. So it sees a frog now. OK, I think this is pretty cool. So this is actually running a Cortex-M7 on a microcontroller doing live object classification in, an, in a video feed. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, so the speed of this, it is measured on the Cortex-M7 running in 260 megahertz um, with 132 kilobytes of RAM used, still running under 256K. Um, at this point, because we're, at this point, we have enough RAM to keep this in. So the, the speed of the microcontroller is actually the limiting part. Um, having a Cortex-M4 or Cortex-M7 is definitely going to help you with use cases that require lots of computation. So here we have three convolu uh, convolution layers. Um, so before CMSIS NN, this took about half a second. And now with CMSIS NN introduced, we can do this in 100 milliseconds. So reach 10 frames a second analyzing a video feed on a microcontroller that is $2.5. I think it's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, so. Recap, I'm holding a little bit short because we're also already over time. Um, how to get started? Well, one, buy development boards. Um, I was told not to do any promotional activity because people in IT have done like that. But uh, uh, we have a bunch of development boards that are compatible here. Um, there's a link, clone uTensor, and, uh, and profit in the end. So I think this is really cool. Like for me, when I ran into this, my, my other interests are LPWNs, you know? And, 
sending large sets of data over the line is impossible. And this allows me to do actual, actual intelligence on the edge or actual intelligence in a home automation system where devices talk to each other, but where I don't actually have to push everything up to the cloud. And I think this is going to, uh, is going to be shipped in a wide variety of products and it definitely has a chance to push the internet of things into the hands of a lot more people. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, so we have time for about minus one questions, but if uh, <laughs> uh, somebody feels a strong urge, uh, one guy is coming up, or are you just leaving us? No? Yeah, well, maybe it's more Edgar Ramos from Ericsson. It's more like a comment than a question. The, the problem I see with this kind of uh, architecture is the same problem that we can see, for example, with mobile phones and having this kind of many, let's say, microcontrollers or, or equipment that have their own things, and then how you can actually address all of them. So let's say you have one algorithm that you want to put in any device, and then how you actually do it in such a way that you can port it to many, many places. So that's something we have to overcome somehow. And I think standardization might be one way to do it. Yeah. Good. It was more a statement than a question. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, up next, I guess. Um, yeah, I'll be around. The slides are already online, youngyoungman.com. Um, if you want to toy around with microtensor or with the simulator, labs at ember.com, your browser, and go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, the next item on the agenda is a remote presentation, so we have to fiddle a little bit here. Yes. Um, so, do we have it? So, Sumia should take, the, take the control. So, Sumia, can you take control? Um, let's see, how can I do that? Yes, but he should be able to do that. So, so Sumi, I, I am connected. I'm trying to see if, uh, presentation mode. No. Or perhaps some of the medical team can change that. Uh, do you know uh, how can I do it? Because so far I don't see. Okay, so if the remote presentation mode doesn't work, we can also show the slides from here and just have to say when you want to have the next slide. Yeah, I think that would work. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, my apologies because I couldn't be there for the presentation, so I have to do it remotely. Uh, my name is uh, Sumia Kantidatta. I'm a research engineer in Eurocom, located in the Sofia Antipolis in France. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, testing semantic interoperability. Uh, it's a small industrial extension of a uh, uh, European yeah. Horizon 2020 project called F Interop. And for those who don't know uh, about Eurocom, just in one slide, you already see it. So we are a graduate school and research center in digital science, and we have many academic, industrial, as well as uh, institutional partners uh, whose, whose logos you see uh, in the screen uh, already. Next, please. Okay, so uh, my presentation would be uh, very brief uh, because we, we have just started uh, our work and I'm basically reporting uh, what we have identified as gap in semantic interoperability testing, what do we propose, uh, the two ways, and I'm conducting a survey and finally conclude the presentation. Next. Okay. 
So as you know, uh, the Internet of Things not only requires uh, smart infrastructure, but also deployment of new services capable of supporting multiple scalable and uh, cross-domain applications. Now, it is often identified and said that interoperability is the key to achieve the full potential of the IoT market. And due to the highly dynamic nature of the IoT, there is a strong need of interoperability at the data level. And in, in that case, it would be easier for aggregation, processing, managing, and storing data coming from all different IoT devices. So uh, recently, many uh, European as well as uh, industrial projects, they have identified semantic interoperability as a way to address this problem. Next. So uh, we need basically a way to test uh, a way to test that would validate the semantic compliance and interoperability among uh, different uh, IoT systems. And this in order would boost the acceptance and adoption of semantic technologies uh, by IoT market. And this is uh, particularly important because when I talk to industry, a lot of people, uh, they, they tell me that they understand uh, the benefits semantics is bring to IoT, but they don't have a way to test and quantify uh, those things. So that's why um, in, in this uh, industrial extension projects, we identify testing semantic interoperability as a uh, quite a gap in the current IoT research and industrial initiatives. And as mentioned, so uh, within the scope of uh, F-Interop projects, uh, Centest, in Centest, we are actually looking into how we can uh, provide some tools, requirements, and guidelines for testing semantic interoperability. Next. Okay, so in SEMTEST, we propose two types of testing. The first one being conform semantic conformance testing. Here, we want to test if a piece of semantic data conform uh, to a reference ontology, any reference ontology, but it has to be uh, a reference ontology. And in the second uh, uh, the type, it's about interoperability testing. So it is to check if two parties or two system under tests understand correctly the exchange semantic data. Next. So, uh, initially, uh, when we started working on it, we started gathering requirements for both the performance test as well as the interoperability test. So uh, for the performance test, we basically um, clustered everything around three main checks. So we should first perform lexical check, then go into uh, a lot of syntactical checks, and finally uh, doing uh, semantic checks. Next. So uh, this is a very basic uh, uh, test scenario that you see. So we have one system on a test and uh, a tester. So the SUT basically sends a piece of semantic data to the tester. And it would, in, in sequence, would perform all the three checks, generate a validation report, and send the validation report back into SUT. Next. Then we came into uh, semantic interoperability testing. So here. Uh, we feel that, uh, again, three levels of validation is necessary. The first one being a communication level check. So here, we basically want to see that the message sent from uh, the first system should be received completely and correctly by a uh, second system. Then we have a lexical or format level check. Here, uh, the message issued from the first system should be in uh, correct and understandable format for the second system for the further data processing. And the third level is uh, the data processing level check. Next. So uh, I tried to represent uh, a very basic scenario using two uh, system under tests uh, here. And in, in this particular test, our objective is to uh, test the semantic processing results into, uh, I mean, from the two systems. So consider um, SUT1, it sends a piece of semantic data, let's call it D1, to SUT2. And the SUT2 runs a query Q1, a Sparkle query Q1 on top of D1. And then SUT2 sends back the result R1 as well as the query Q1. Uh, to SUT1. And the system under test one, it would execute the same query Q1 on the same data it had sent before. And let's say the result uh, this time is uh, R1 complement. 
So SU21 would actually verify if both R1 and R1 complement are the same. So if uh, they are same or equivalent, we'd say we have 100% uh, interoperability. Otherwise, we'd say it, uh, these two system under tests are not semantically interoperable. Next. Now, uh, since Eurocom and our partner in the project Easy Global Market, so we both uh, work as well as follow the 1M2M standard. So we want to map uh, the interactions and the system under test in the previous uh, slide with uh, 1M2M entities. So in this presentation, you see that we have uh, clearly segmented. Uh, <laughs> Ari, I'm getting uh, quite some uh, echo. Uh, okay, uh, so in this uh, slide, you see that uh, we have basically um, uh, identified the application entity as well as common service entity of the 1M2 architecture, and we show the same set of uh, operations and we divide them with respect to the application entity and the common service entity. So it's basically the same representation of the slide 10 with respect to 1 and 2 m in, in the slide 11. Next. Now, I think it starts to get a little bit more interesting when we uh, introduce um, uh, additional computational uh, components between the system under tests. So let's say uh, we have uh, a query server which is generating the query q1 and it is sending the same query both to SUT one and two so and then the system under test they execute the query one on their semantic data and return the result to the query server and the query server is going to compare r1 and r2 and check uh, if, if they are same if they're same then we have achieved interoperability otherwise um, we we haven't uh, next, uh, so the next uh, uh, test we are doing is to see how to achieve interoperability at the data level. So in the in this particular case, so we extend um, what you saw in the last slide in, into in this side. So we have two system under tests and a third party tester. So. SUT, uh, so here our objective is to test uh, the semantic data for checking if they share the same vocabulary. So uh, when SUT1 sends the semantic data D1 to the tester, so the tester would retrieve the vocabulary V1 from the semantic data it receives. And it would do the same thing uh, for D2 coming from SUT2. So it would retrieve the vocabulary V2 and then compare V1 and V2. And the comparison result would be sent both to both of the system under test. And if we see that V1 and V2 are identical, then they are said to be interoperable completely. Otherwise, uh, they are not interoperable. Next. Um, then we also uh, can think of a little bit more complicated uh, uh, scenario for data level interoperability uh, testing. And uh, the main motivation of um, uh, imagining uh, or conceiving this type of scenario is that we have to, uh, since we are building an uh, industrial extension of the FNTROF platform, so we um, would like to use what it FNTROF offer offers and uh, extend it with respect to additional components. So the comparison server uh, that you see in the center of the slide uh, could be coming from all the already developed project and in, in some test we can think of bringing the SUT1 to as well as the two testers and here the principles uh, remain uh, almost similar that you saw in the uh, previous slide so we retrieve the vocabulary V1 from uh, the semantic data A1 and we uh, retrieve the vocabulary V2 from the semantic data A2 and then the two testers are sending the two vocabularies v1 and v2 to the comparison server then the comparison server is evaluating them and if both of them are same we have 100 percent probability otherwise not next okay so that was all my presentation so it was uh, 
basically i was telling you the first steps that we are that we have took so far to define the different tests and the scenarios architectures uh, different uh, data that's going um, uh, originating from one a system under test one to two if we have additional components in between now uh, we are also uh, uh, um, doing one survey so i i would request uh, all of you to take about five minutes and uh, complete uh, this survey ari has always already done it and it's my request to all of you to, to do it it's gonna help uh, uh, this project a lot and if you see i have missed any requirements or did not uh, consider any requirement uh, feel free to uh, drop a note uh, there as well next so uh, in a nutshell uh, my presentation uh, is about uh, how can we test semantic interoperability because it's uh, highly necessary for different iot systems and uh, in this project we have proposed two types of tests and um, we propose some scenarios to implement the semantic performance and interoperability Yes, so I think I have a typo there. And uh, as of uh, future work, so we are actually implementing this test within the FNTROP platform. So we are currently seeing how we can uh, align the system under test with respect to what FNTROP have, has uh, as of now and how we can integrate our uh, the system under test as well as the tester and the software components into the uh, FNTROP platform. And we'll soon be uh, re reporting our results uh, pretty soon. Uh, next. So this is uh, our acknowledgement since uh, SEMTEST is an industrial extension of the FNTROF project, which I received funding from uh, European Union H2020 uh, project. And SEMTEST is a joint uh, collaborative project between Easy Global Market and Eurocom. So we both are located very close to Etsy. If you have visited Sofia Antipoli, so you'd uh, definitely know. Uh, that's all. As on the, uh, if you have any question, uh, you can ask me, or uh, you, if you are coming to uh, the WebOptins meeting, so we can meet and discuss personally. And uh, uh, please take the service, that's going to help a lot. So, with that, uh, I would say thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to speak here, and uh, thanks for your listening. Thank you, Sumya, for doing this so quickly. So Sumya was here for the, the hackathon over the weekend, but uh, had to go back. And uh, for once, the remote presentation has worked reasonably well. So thank you. Do we have any questions? Again, we have time for about not none, but... Uh... Okay, thank you, Sumya. And uh, we go on to the next presentation. Okay, thank you, Carson. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bring it up. So it's just gonna tell it and just press enter. Yes. Sometimes it takes some time for them being patient because it's explodes. You're always patient. Okay, thank you. Um so I'm Michal Kroll, I'm from UCL College London. And um, together with my colleagues, we currently do quite a lot of work about um, about outsourcing computations. Um, so when we want to have source of computation, basically we have some re uh, requesting node which has some input and uh, payment that is willing to pay for the computation, and um, then the executing node, enter. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we basically want to send the input, enter, then provide the results, send it back to the, um, to the requesting node, enter, verify that the result is correct, and then in the end, we'll perform the payment. And Great, thank you. Um, so right now, this is done in the cloud. So we have Microsoft, Amazon, Google, we have the cloud, we have the computations. This is the cloud has its um, unlimited resources, and we get back the results. However, we have, um, I think here, I don't have to convince anyone that running it at the end has several benefits in terms of delay, cost, and also in terms of uh, privacy. So in our vision, we want to have a mesh at nodes. So even if I have my laptop, I have some spare CPU, I can just accept some tasks, run them locally, and uh, be paid for the execution. However, it changes kind of the, um, the trust management.
because if you have Google or Amazon, we have to trust, we give them our data, and we trust that they're not going to misbehave. Here, we have like untrusted nodes with laptops. Um, the security and privacy must be built in the system design. So we cannot just trust that the other part is not going to misbehave. We have to be sure that it's not going to happen. Also, we want to have this open system when everyone can just join, so no betting system. Um, if you if I have some spares here, I just join and execute stuff. Um, we want to have incentives, so the nodes are rewarded for their work, and we want this uh, to be called centralized so without any consent or judges that will act in terms uh, in case of conflict. Um, so concerning the rewards, of course, if I have my laptop and I'm running some, I'm using my CPU to run competition for others, I want to be rewarded for that. So it should be also the main driving point for joining the system. Because in many peer-to-peer -peer systems, that was the problem, there were no incentives. So if you consider torrents, everyone wants to get files, but then why would I share my, like use my bandwidth uh, to give files to other people? However, before um, paying, I would like to verify the result. So be sure that I didn't receive just a random string of bytes. And there's also this problem when the payment should be done. Because if I'm a requesting node, I don't want to pay in advance, because then the execution platform can just take the money and walk away. And the same applies from the execution node. So you don't want to run the execution before being paid, because then again, you send back the results, and the guy can just walk away without paying. So the result verification is also a very crucial part of the system. So we can have different types of tasks. So we can have proof of work types of tasks, and it's very easy to, to check if the task was, very, um, uh, was correct or not. So we just uh, compare it against the hash. However, usually uh, verification means that we have to recompute the whole task and then compare it, the result is the same. Um, so in many systems, um, we can generate cryptographic proofs, like zero-knowledge proofs, uh, to prove that the um, result is correct. However, usually it implies very high cost. Sometimes it's even much higher than the computation itself. And also, it's not available for every single computation. Another solution would be to send the, the task to many people. Then we get back the result. We compare them. If they're the same, there's a high chance that it was um, that the result is correct. However, it's highly inefficient because we have to pay for every single computation. And also we have to prevent colluding, because if um, two execution platforms collude, they can just send, send me the same um, random result. And then I will I have no idea that something bad happened. So then we also submit some input and we get some results and we want to make it private, but not only private from the, from the network, uh, but also from the execution platform. And this is difficult because the execution platform must actually compute something on top of our data. So in the cloud, usually now we use homomorphic encryption. However, again, it introduces quite a lot of overhead, and it's not always possible. Um, the other solution would be to use trusted execution environments, which basically allows us to write um, to have trusted enclave on untrusted nodes. Uh, however, they require dedicated hardware. So now I just present to you key technologies we use in our system. So first is uh, Intel SGX. So it's an example of the trusted execution environment. So basically what it does, it allows us to create a um, protected part of memory that is an um, enclave running on top of that. So then only this process can re read and write uh, to this part of memory. It is invisible and encrypted from the operating system or the hypervisor. And um, <coughs> this Intel SGX, comes with a remote attestation protocol. So if I'm a remote node, I can check, first of all, if on the remote host I have the valid Intel SGX platform, then I can verify that the function running on the remote host is the function I requested. And in the end, I can also uh, establish a secure communication channel. So I can communicate directly with the function, kind of bypassing the, the execution node. And we also leverage heavily on blockchain. Um, so we built on smart contracts that allow to add some logic on top of uh, on top of a blockchain. In our case, it's Ethereum with um, Solidity, so <laughs> featuring complete language. Uh, however, everything that we submit 
to the blockchain is publicly visible, so we have to be very careful with this request. Chris. Yeah, just a re <coughs> request to speak a little closer to the microphone. Oh, please. okay, okay. Is it better? Okay, sorry. Um, so then the, the problem with um, smart contracts is that, um, first of all, they're pretty expensive to execute, and second of all, uh, there is quite a long delay because if we submit a transaction, then we need to wait till it's um, uh, confirmed. So to tackle up this problem, we also use payment channels. So payment channels uh, allows us to run transactions off chain, which is like much, um, it is like almost no cost and no delay in processing. So they're secured by deposits run on top of blockchain. However, all the communication is off blockchain. And the last component are oracles, so smart contracts by themselves, they have no knowledge and, or they cannot communicate with the external world. So we have like a um, virtual machine. And oracles uh, can act as uh, trusted data feeds. So if I want to query a um, trusted HTTP, uh, HTTPS server, I can do it with an oracle and then I can get also a proof that the <coughs> data I got is valid. So then the overview of the system, just the assumptions, we have requesting node and executing node. They both distrust one another. However, they trust the function. So if I call this function, I know that it's gonna do image processing or video rendering. Um, however, both requester and executing node, they trust uh, the blockchain. And also we assume that the executing node has complete uh, control over its system, operating system, hyper hypervisor, and so on. There's going to be a lot of animation. <laughs> uh, so here, as uh, previously, we have the um, on the top we have requesting node that has some input. On the top, on the bottom, we have um, the execution platform, and on the right, we have blockchain running with smart contracts. So first of all, enter. Um, the execution platform runs the enclave. Enter. Now the um, the requesting node can establish this uh, secure communication with the um, with the function, enter, and verify its identity. So now Enclave can generate a proof, enter, and send it back to the, um, uh, to the requesting node, enter. Now we know that it's secure to send uh, our input to the, to the Enclave. And again, this input that we send is now uh, secured from the, from the executing platform. So it's only visible for the function, enter. So now, after some time, the Denklet will, uh, will compute the result. And at this point, um, the execution platform generates a secret. Um, sorry, a key. So this key is then transferred to the Enclave, and the Enclave will use this um, key to, to encrypt uh, the result. Enter. So then this encrypted result is sent back to the, uh, to the execution node. So now we have the result, however, it's encrypted. Enter. We also send um, a hash of this key that we use to encrypt the result. Enter. And both the result and hash have attestation from the enclave, so we are sure that they are correct. Enter. So now the execution node is um, sending an, a transaction with the payment for the executing node, uh, executing platform. However, it can be unlocked only if we submit a secret, uh, the secret key, and we can verify it using this hash, enter. So now if the executing node um, submits the secret to the, to the blockchain, it will unlock the payment, enter. And at the same time, the key, the key becomes visible, so the, so the client gets the, the secret and can use it to unlock the, the result, enter. So, here it works, however, we have two problems. So first of all, it can be pretty uh, slow and expensive to, to do everything on the, on the blockchain. And second of all, I can always send some computation to the executing node, wait until it uh, executes my stuff, and then just walk away. So this kind of um, denial of service uh, attack, enter. So to deal with this problem, we here introduce payment channels. So now sending this money and unlocking is cheap, it has almost no cost, and it's also very fast. So we can, um, 
So we can divide our tasks into very, very, um, very, um, to a, into a lot of small tasks and do everything um, chunk by chunk. And so, so here the whole process is the same. However, because we don't require any cost for the transaction, okay, so, so we can do it very quickly. So now, even if I submit a chunk of work, I don't know, 10 seconds of CPU and just walk away, the execution platform loses only 10 seconds of its time and not more. And, uh, and to make it um, perfectly secure, the problem is in this communication. So in this channel of data between the requesting node and the enclave, because it's secured and no one knows what's happened. So if the communication fails, the smart contract or no one else is not able to say if it's because of uh, the network failure or because the execution platform didn't want to compute anything or maybe just the requester walked away. Um, enter. So basically we can either submit everything to the blockchain and then everyone will know. But of course it implies a big cost. And in our solution we decided to go with IPFS. So the result, if there is a problem, so the, the requesting node just walked away, the execution platform <coughs> has this, um, ability to uh, put the result on the, on the IPFS, then the smart contract can use Oracle to query it and to verify the file and unlock the payment uh, for, the, for the execution platform. That's all. <laughs> so to conclude, um, we have a system for result verification and automatic payments. It is fully automated and we have all this of magnitude lower overhead than system uh, the, the state of the art. We have no third parties involved. Uh, however, we have those limitations because it runs uh, on Intel ATX, so it must be it requires <laughs> by hardware. And currently, the limit of the application is up to 100 megabytes. Is there time for a short question? Uh -huh. um, I was wondering whether you did a comparison with some of the other sort of edge computing uh, solutions that are out there. Sorry, say again. Did you, did you do a sort of a comparison between your approach and the, uh, as some other uh, edge computing platforms out there? Like there's, as you know, there's work on OpenFork, uh, like uh, Microsoft, Amazon, we mm -hmm. and others have uh, uh, sort of an edge computing solution. And so I was wondering whether you've done a, a comparison. No, it is a um, fairly early work, uh, but I'm not aware of any solution that can like prove you that the result is uh, correct. Well, they, they, obviously they have different characteristics, but they are pros and cons. Uh, so that would be that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. like the, we started this work at, uh, as a workshop paper, so it was uh, yeah it's to be published. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that's. Um, but you mean the comparison in terms of... No, no, no. Um, in general, the solution, with, you, you have uh, worked on an edge computing solution, as you yeah, yeah. explained, and one, with one specific set of characteristics, uh, and, but there are other edge computing solutions mm -hmm. out there that people worked on, and they have different characteristics. I would be curious on how they compare to each other. Yeah, so we were, before writing the paper, we were looking for systems that have like, the same characteristic. We didn't find any. Okay. But yeah, then maybe broaden the, the scope yeah. of uh, comparison. Like the, the other system. solutions don't use, don't have blockchain. Uh, mm. That may or may not be a good thing. Uh, sure. I have my own opinion <laughs> about that, but, um, um, but they have other interesting characteristics that your solution may not have. So uh, maybe sure. if you do that um, comparison, I would be, um, drop a mail to the, to the list. I would be interested to read that. Thank you. So I have one more slide, just to have some open questions that we still have. Um, so if we assume that we have this network and we see it as a global computer, we would probably need something more efficient to dispatch tasks, because now it's kind of up to the nodes to negotiate the price and stuff like that. Um, however, if you want to have a module that will just dispatch tasks automatically between nodes, then the, um, I think it's uh, pretty difficult because then if the payment is involved, how do we define fairness in this case? Um, especially if we have like different prices, loads, and uh, node capacities. Uh, also, how to estimate the cost of the computations in terms of CPU, bandwidth, memory, quality of service, knowing again that we have very heterogeneous um, environment. 
and how to provide full privacy. Because in this case, we uh, we protect input and the result. However, we still know who uh, invoked uh, which function. So this is also probably good to hide it as well. So I think that's all. Thank you. More questions? OK. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think this was uh, interesting uh, also for people who thought that TLS was complicated. And uh, um, I think we're going to see some, some really interesting security constructions uh, to, to uh, make things uh, work in an environment where we can trust less. Um, and uh, uh, this, I think, is just an interesting example uh, for that. And uh, when you want to decentralize, you, of course, uh, no longer always know who you are talking with. Um, so um, the last item on the agenda is a quick peek at the uh, meeting schedule. Now I have to find my slides again. They requested two minutes on that. Yes. Uh, why does that not work? Oops. Hey Dave, do you want to come to the mic? Uh, Dave Taylor, so uh, mine is not about the agenda per se, mine is about the logistics of getting there. Um, the meeting is uh, tomorrow afternoon in Prague, and I know several people are on the 7.20 a.m. flight out of Heathrow, so my question is, uh, as far as carpooling, since this is before like Heathrow Express runs and so on, uh, I'm organizing a car, can I get a count of how many people would want to travel together? Uh, we would be leaving the hotel lobby at about 4.20 a.m. tomorrow. Okay. Uh, if you'd like to carpool and come together in a shared car, please raise your hand so I can count. One, two, three. Anybody else here? Okay, I just need to give the, 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 the concierge a count for how big of a car to get. So, so far I see three in this room. Uh, if you know of anybody else, let me know because after this meeting, I will go and uh, get the car booked. So is anybody going via Stansted? Okay. Good. So, so what? Chris, just a short comment. You, the, I think the first Heathrow Express leaves at 5.10, but uh, there's the Heathrow Connect, which actually leaves earlier. So, But I guess it depends on when you want to be at the airport. Yeah, the concierge recommended for travel to Prague that you be at the airport like two hours in advance, and it's a one-hour trip. So that, that's why he recommended 4.20 for uh, car departure, or 7.10 and 4.10 for the car departure. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, what we wanted to do is, is give you just a quick peek into the uh, kind of things that we are doing at these coordination uh, meetings. So this is uh, uh, the first time that we actually, uh, no, it's not actually not the first time. It, it's another time that we're actually having W3C and, and uh, OCF in one room together with a, a research group. And um, of course, we, we're going to do, do status updates uh, between each other. We will also talk about Wishy um, again. Uh, but th there are a few issues that really aren't standardized yet. And so, for instance, one uh, issue that, that comes up repeatedly is that <clears throat> when you actually uh, request some action from an IoT device, how do you know what data you actually need to send with that uh, action so that the LT device can do the right thing? So this is a slightly different problem from simply requesting data. You can request those data and then think about them and so on. But if you actually want uh, the light to be green or uh, the loudspeaker to be loud or something like that, how do you actually uh, specify uh, this in a way that, that allows interoperability? So that's one thing we're going to uh, talk about. 
Uh, more generally, we will talk about model interoperability, so things we, we tested in the hackathon. Um, and uh, yeah, what, what's the next step uh, to make sure the various models that are popular right now uh, interoperate? The IPSO or lightweight M2M model is, is uh, relatively simple and, and straightforward, pretty easy to uh, translate. Thing description is very powerful. Um, uh, OCF has uh, th this Remel Swagger based uh, modeling uh, scheme. So, how do you put these things together? Um, another thing, again, on the, on the protocol level is how do we model the various forms of pushing uh, data? So, we know publish, subscribe is a, a pretty popular way uh, to model that, but uh, also has its uh, problem problems. And uh, it would be interesting to see whether, uh, uh, yeah, uh, additional extensions of REST beyond what we already have in COI, which is the observe uh, function, uh, would be useful to, to better handle these uh, push models. So there's actually a research group draft called non-traditional responses, and we want to discuss how useful uh, that would be. Um, we want to talk about the, the uh, area of uh, data that you actually install or, or obtain from an IoT device about its relationships to other uh, devices. So how can you actually bind a light switch to a light? Uh, how do you describe the interfaces? Uh, how, how do you build the links? And how do the resource representations uh, look like? And then, of course, we have uh, housekeeping on the base uh, co op document, like new response codes, uh, uh, talking about the resource directory. Um, there are different ideas on, on how to uh, use that and so on. And uh, finally, we are going to talk about ACE, the security, uh, the authorization working group within the ITF, and how that uh, could be useful for the OCF which have their own security uh, model already in place. And they, they also have interesting authorization formats and so on that we could uh, talk about. But one interesting question is, how do we get multi-point uh, security in? So uh, somebody sent me uh, a link to the Fair Hair uh, white paper, the Fair Hair security white paper, which uh, nicely describes how they are going to do all their security. And then there is this section seven, which hand waves about multipoint security. I think that, that's really something that, that we need to do some more uh, work on. So this is standardization, and, and finally, um, of course, we, we uh, all benefit from the availability of reference implementations and from test cases. So we want to discuss how we uh, uh, get a better situation uh, with co-op, uh, particular curb over TCP, CBAR, and, and other uh, standards that we are using. So this entire thing we want to do in one afternoon, that will be a rather grand program, but uh, yeah, we can always uh, factor out things to, to telephone calls uh, later on. So this is our next meeting. I already said a little bit about uh, other uh, meetings uh, going on. And uh, I'm pretty certain that we are going to have a summary meeting at the, the Montreal uh, EHF. Uh, so uh, if you uh, don't follow this working group very closely, uh, you can still come to the summary meeting and find out what uh, we have been doing. So thank you for uh, coming and have a nice rest of an ITF. Thank you, and if you haven't yet signed the blue sheet, please sign, sign them before you leave. Thanks.
Oh ja. Im Prinzip, wie 